the hatred against my Jewish people was all about. Well, I was only about uh, eight years old. Um, it started very slowly, meaning that cruelty of the people against, uh, against us. But my perseverance and luck and outlook on life has brought me to this stage of life. I tried to make the best of a hardship or pleasant life. When I speak in schools and to people like you, uh, I like to mention good things can come to, to you by working hard and never give up. So uh, I, I had three periods of my life. My childhood was great. I, until I was eight years old, I had non-Jewish friends. We were speakers, playing on the street, uh, all kinds of games. And then all of a sudden on the 30th of January, 1933, that was when Hitler got to power. Uh, they didn't speak to me anymore. I was avoided. We, we, I, I had a friend that uh, his father was working for the railroad. They were not very well off, they were poor, but he wouldn't speak to me anymore. And, and I always shared my lunch with him. In fact, my mother made so, so that I could share it with him. 33 came and nothing, and that was it. Uh, that kind of and I was only uh, how old? eight years old. That disturbed me. I uh, didn't know what to make of it. But that was it. So there were three, two other boys in the class. And the teacher, you know, in Germany, the first four years, we have the same teacher, same classroom. And he showed up in brown shirts. And you can imagine how he talked about the Jews. And we were sitting in the last row of the class, which was very disturbing. But, uh, you know, I was too young to really realize what's going on. And through re to, in recess, the three of us were in the corner of the schoolyard so that we don't get attacked. And, well, that's the way it was. And, and by 1935, Hitler put a, a, a law out that Jews cannot work for non-Jews and non-Jews not for Jews. So that it was really difficult because my father had to help two uh, women helping him in his business. He had a mimeographing office and that was it. Uh, there wasn't much that he could do about it. No matter, it didn't matter. He was a veteran of the First World War and he was blinded and his brother got killed in the war. It didn't matter to them. A Jew, that's it. So we had to give up the dog. We had to give up uh, you know, the radio we could keep for a while. But there were all kinds of restrictions that the Jews had. And that was in 35. And uh, a lot of people 
a lot of Jewish people that had money left in 35, 36. My friends that I was with, their parents were doctors, both of them. They went to the United States in 36 because they couldn't, there was nothing they could do. Uh, you know, the, the Jews didn't get sick that much, so uh, there was no business. So, and then comes the Christian night. Christian night, you heard of it, I'm sure. That was all Jewish men above 18 years old were incarcerated. Uh, at uh, on the ninth, uh, no, on the tenth of November, the, you know the synagogues, and uh, they were burned or destroyed that night, and the Jewish stores were destroyed. That that's why it said Crystal Night because they smashed all the windows and looted. They, they went in with old clothes and came out with new. And the police was only there to keep order so that nobody attacks their own people. I witnessed that because my father, that was one thing, they left him alone. But 30,000 Jewish men were incarcerated, mainly in concentration camps or prisons, and 9,000 did not survive. And the rest of them that came back were told, you got four or six weeks to leave the country with nothing but 10 marks. So a lot of people, some of them had money, enough to, to get out. The United States was not very generous to take them. In fact, the Jews were standing in front of the American embassy in Berlin and all the Gestapo had to do, you know what Gestapo is, secret police. They all had to do is round them up and that was it. They didn't even have to go and arrest them at their homes. That was in 38, and that was the beginning of the end of the Jewish people in Germany. And uh, well, I couldn't go to school anymore. I was kicked out of school, literally, because I didn't know that I couldn't go to school on the 10th of November, but uh, they, they, made me feel that I wasn't welcome, okay? So I stayed home. I couldn't go out on the street. I would get beat up. So uh, my parents decided to send me away uh, to a supposedly agricultural school. But that, uh, well, it didn't out, it didn't, it wasn't a cult, uh, agricultural school. It was slave labor. We had to dig, dig the not with a horse and plow. We had to do it by hand. <clears throat> and at that time, I was, in fact, I was not quite fourteen yet when I had to leave the house. Uh, that was not very nice. It, I felt very bad to leave my parents. I mean, I had nobody to talk to. I was more or less in that little town that we lived in. The Jews all left because in a little town, it's uh, very difficult to survive as a Jew. But my father, since he was blinded, he couldn't move anywhere. It was, you know, uh, it was his house and he was 
very familiar with everything that uh, was in it, and uh, he just couldn't move. Which, well, that was it. And that that was the all right. That was in 1939, April, I think it was. Uh, I went to that camp until October. In October, we were Zionist young people, and we the, they said that we can go to another camp, but it'll be will be smaller, and you can be Zionists and you can do what uh, uh, we what. You have to work, but you have your own privacy. And we had, we had a, a farm that used to be owned by Jewish people. We had 50 acres. We had four cows. We had pigs. <laughs> we had, uh, uh, we had ducks and chickens and we had, we, the food was, we were not, we had food, even though Jews only had half the ration cards that the others had. But since we could grow our own and uh, <laughs> something very funny happened, we, uh, they decided our, we had a couple of, managers and they decided that if we kill a pig we would be better off than having the ration cards for some time so a shohrit came to kill the pig and made it kosher <laughs> well, it, it was funny but we lived we lived very good in those days as long as it lasted they used every little thing that the pig had uh, that lasted for about a year and a half we had to work for farmers uh, and big farmers we tried to avoid them but sometimes we had to the little farmers, they were nice. We had to work hard, but we had lunch with them on in the field. And the, the, the wife brought, or somebody brought the lunch, and we could eat the same as a, uh, uh, as a farmer. You know, I'm talking a lot about food, but that was all we were thinking about. When you are hungry, you want food, and that occupies your your brain. That's the way it was all through the end. Not today anymore. <laughs> uh, well, we stayed there for a year and a half, and then the farmers decided that they want our farm. So, well, if they decide what they want, we had no right to keep it. They took over everything. We had 50 acres. We had cows and pigs and everything. They took it all. They shipped us out to another camp, labor, forced labor camp near Berlin. And we had to work for the, well, everybody had to work somewhere in, in agriculture for the farmers, uh, the, the, the camp was run by non-Jews. He was not very nice, but they had a big farm uh, and a lot of our boys had to work there. But um, a, few a few boys of us, we were assigned to work for the city that was about uh, 15, 20 minutes away. For the, we, we did park work. We, we worked on the streets. 
We worked in the forest. We worked digging graves. Well, digging graves was not a bad deal because uh, not for us. They, we dug the grave for the Germans. And uh, we, uh, well, we dug them and we had to stand behind the bushes in case some sand falls in or something, we had to take it out. But the people came and said, they, they, oh, we forgot the flowers. Can you, can you get us some flowers? They didn't know who we were, even though we had a Jewish star. So we figured, okay, the cemetery is full of flowers. So the first time we were asked, we figured, well, we're going to get some flowers for them. And we collected some, made a nice bouquet and gave it to them. And they paid us some. And then we figured, well, if they come, there'll be more people coming. So let's do the, let's have a business. We collected some flowers off the graves and we had a business. We were four boys and the money that we got, we bought non food that was not on ration cards. Well, whatever it was, it was good for our stomachs. And uh, the flowers, well, we had, we, we made a few of them every day when we, we were working there, digging graves. You know, people die. So once, one or two graves a day, maybe only one, one time. But it always, there was always somebody that forgot the flowers. Well, that was until 1943, in to the 8th of April. The camp itself was very bad. The, the, the barracks were bad, the beds were bad, the food was lousy, uh, always the same, and it, was, it didn't taste good, but there was nothing for us. And, uh, well, on the 8th of April, 1943, we were arrested. You see, as forced laborers, we were still in civilian clothes. We were marked, sure, we had a Jewish star and our IDs had J's on it. And they were, um, we were identified as Jews and everybody had to have an ID, so there was no, no way to escape. So on, then when we were arrested, we were taken, they told us, get your things together, you got two hours or three hours, and they took us to Berlin to an assembly place, and when they had a thousand people, they put us in cattle cars, a hundred each. They had 10 cars with a steam engine in front. Uh, we left Berlin, I don't know. We were arrested on the H. We were taken to Berlin to that, Jew, it used to be a Jewish school. We were 50 in each classroom. And when they had a thousand, they took us to the, to the train station and uh, shipped us in cattle cars, a hundred each. We had, we had room to sit down. Lying down was impossible. We sit down with the legs meeting each uh, from the other side, you know. So, uh, uh, and for hygiene, they put a bucket in the middle of the kettle car, no curtains, and we were boys, girls, old people, uh, all together. It was, it was just, 
unimaginable. And nobody ate, nobody drank. But you know, nature calls, so it, it was just, uh, it was terrible. Especially, we were young people. I mean, I was, how old was I then? I was uh, 16, 17, almost 17. And girls our age, I mean, I can't, I can't express myself how bad that was. And we, we were arrested on the 8th. And on the 20th, we arrived in Auschwitz. We didn't know what Auschwitz was. We had no idea. When they opened the, the doors, you know, the, from the kettle car, the sliding door, always we seen striped uniform, the prisoners. That's when it dawned on us that we were, we are prisoners. So they chased us out. All our belongings stayed in the kettle car and uh, we were assembled and then there was a selection. Selection was to the left, women, children, old men, old men over 35, okay? Young people below 14. And uh, well, if they, if the SS figured, uh, well, they're good enough to work, age was not then that important. Um, you heard of Dr. Mengele, right? Well, he was the, what, uh, they had a name for him, Doctor of Death or something. Uh, whether he did the selection on that day, I was there, I have no idea. But we were told to be dressed like workers. We, and we did. I mean, we were workers. We had, I had uh, uh, um, boots on and real work clothes. And most of us, in fact, all of us that came from that camp were selected to work. The women, it's the same as the men. They, they were, the women were in a women camp, but they worked uh, in offices in Auschwitz or so. And we were shipped to another sub-camp to Buna, or Monovich, they call it. it we, uh, it was owned by IG Farben. IG Farben is the same as Dow Chemical. They made rubber, they made chemicals of any kind. And we were building a refinery from coal to gasoline. There were uh, coal mines that were operated by prisoners. Uh, I don't know, somebody told me that they had 14 sub camps of all kinds for coal mines mainly and uh, uh, factories for parts for the factory that we were building and so on. Uh, well, when you start a new job that we did, it was, well, let me go back. We were, we got to the camp and we had to undress. We were still in our civilian clothes. We had to undress and they told us we had to put the pants, the shirt, all separated. And all we could keep were the shoes. And then we got our hair taken off. You know, we were uh, 17 years old. I was very proud of my hair. My hair and all of a sudden I was, we didn't recognize each other. And then we got the number on the arm. You have a picture of it, right, Melanie? So, uh, and I don't know which hurt more. 
the, the, the number or the hair? I think the hair. We were so shocked and we looked at each other. Remember, we were naked. We looked at each other, we didn't recognize each other. Because without hair, you look altogether different. Well, we were assigned to barracks and we, handed, we were handed clothes. Underwear was, uh, well, more hold than underwear. And we had f five pieces that were our life. Pants, shirt, a little round hat, a bowl, and a spoon. Those five pieces your life depended on. Uh, well, I didn't realize all that. So I, uh, we were in the barracks and there was a washroom. So we went to the washroom. And uh, like, you know, we were trained to wash ourselves good. So I took my clothes off. I kept the pants on, I just my jacket. And I washed myself. And when I turned around, my jacket was gone. Without a jacket, you're finished. You go to the oven. It's a, that's it. You're, they accuse you of trying to escape. So um, I don't think I was thinking very much. All I was afraid, I had to have a jacket. And I wasn't the only one that did that. So there was another jacket hanging. And you can imagine what I did. I still, I still uh, feel bad about it. Because somebody had to go. And it's, it's, but you know, you want to live. And you don't think of what others, you, you, you have to be me, myself, and I. We were three friends, we shared everything, but we were still each for them, not for themselves, but you needed to take care of yourself. So uh, uh, we, try to stay out of everybody's problems. Every, we all, we, uh, number one, we, uh, when we came to the barracks, we wanted, we went all the way back and uh, there were three, uh, three beds, you know, three bunks on it, on top of each other. And, uh, we wanted the top one for a reason. We didn't want to get wet. You never know who's above you. This way, when we were on top, there was nobody above. And uh, well, we got bad jobs first. It was uh, uh, the first day I was on in a work detail that had a lifespan of two days. Well. I knew that I had to get out of there, but there were other, there were Zionists in, in the camp and we befriended them right away because, well, they came to us too. And, uh, well, I got out of that one and I went to another comp, uh, work detail that had uh, a lifespan of two, three weeks. We were digging trenches and put cable in, you know, you probably seen them, those electric cables that they have on big rows and they're pretty heavy. So we had to dig the, great, the trench first and then we put, uh, we put the cable into the trench. And I was, uh, well, I wasn't very nice, but I figured I'm gonna look for tall people, a tall one in front and a tall one in the back. And I was carrying with my shoulders up. 
<laughs> in other words, I didn't carry. I had to save myself. Maybe not good, not very nice, but I did. And uh, then I befriended, uh, no, they were, they were looking for electrician or mechanic. Well, here I am. I had no idea about anything. But I figured that has to be easier than take and, and maybe inside, but it had to be easier than digging and carrying. And it was. I, the detail was working for Siemens. You, you heard of Siemens. They make uh, irons, they make all kinds of things. And uh, I was detailed with maybe 70 or 80 people to work in the power plant. And the engineer of the power plant was a Berliner. Well, I spoke fluent German and he was very nice to me. And so I was a Berliner. I was in Berlin. I knew Berlin very well because I had a lot of relatives there. So uh, I worked in his office. I had it made. For a year and a half, I was the luckiest one in the world. All I had to do is march in and march out. And when I was in the fact, in the, on the ground of the factory, I knew I was safe. And uh, the engineer, once in a while, he brought me a sandwich. But what he did is he put me in the corner and he told me, you're going to eat it up right now. And then he turned me around and he looked me over if there was any crumb anywhere, had to get rid of it. Because when the SS came, you know who the SS is, was, uh, uh, they were in control of everything in the black uniforms. When they came, uh, the engineer had a hard time with them because we were working on 20,000 volt generators. They were not powered yet, but the, the SS on the, you know, on the door to the workroom was, you know, uh, high power, high voltage. And the engineer said, you can't go in. If you disturb my people, we're going to have a problem. And you're going to have the problem because you're going to have to tell the factory gen managers what you did, you disturbed it. You disturbed our power plant uh, construction. Well, one time or two times they were, they had, they came in and uh, the uh, engineer was warning us by yelling, uh, you know, like uh, we were just about being killed by him. And that was our sign that uh, we had to be careful now. So that was my life in, in the camp. I told you I was lucky all my life. And on the 17th of January, 1945, we were assembled and marched out of the camp, naturally with, with guards, because the Russians, we could hear the Russians uh, coming. I mean, they were shooting and what have you. Oh, by the way, we were bombed in, uh, in the, uh, the factory was bombed three times, maybe four. The first couple of times, they didn't do much good because uh, they missed uh, the biggest part of it. And they did not put one plane load, but 
five kilometers away to bomb the, the, the crematorium and the gas chambers. The, from what I heard after we, after, well, long time after, the Americans were afraid they would kill people. Well, the people were dead anyhow. And if they would have done that, just one plane load, they were, we were bombed two hours and one, uh, one, you know, they came six of them, three like a, like a, uh, like a, um, a bird, one wave after the other. And they dropped bombs, all, um, all of them dynamite bombs, 500 pounders. And uh, a lot of them were Dutch because if they didn't hit something hard, they just went into the sand and that was it. We dug them up later, but uh, it was just that they didn't do go one, I mean, just uh, as far as we are concerned, one inch over and they could have saved a hundred thousand people. Well, uh, I, we went on the march on the 17th of January. The first two days we went to another city where all the cattle cars, not cattle cars, coal cars were assembled. But we were supposedly, from what I heard, 60,000 prisoners all coming to that town because all that was a railroad center and coal cars all over the place. Well, whether I was lucky or unlucky, I was running into, I couldn't, I didn't, there was no coal car for the people. There were some, most of them, but for me, there was no coal car. So I ran into a, because I heard shooting. So I ran into a bunch of people. Uh, I was told we were 3,000 and we were marched. Marched from the 17th, no, there was a 19th of January and I marched until the 23rd of April. We were 3,000, so I was told, and we left, we wound up with 200 and 120 of us. They start eating like, you know, you can't do that because this, we, we, were, we weren't fed for three and a half months. We lived on snow and once in a while they gave us something and once in a while we could steal something and that was, we were just decimated. And uh, whenever somebody fell or stepped out of line, they were shot. And um, well, it was winter and we, uh, the ones who were shot, we, we undressed them. We needed clothing because the clothing that we had originally was too thin, was too cold. So we had layers over layers we, we put on. It sounds bad, we undressed the killed ones. So we had to save ourselves. So that was until the 23rd of April, I, I had two friends who in the last couple of days, they carried me and I, we sa I said, this is it. You can't, you have to survive. Leave me and whatever happens, happens. So they picked me up and uh, threw me in a coal car and that coal car went to another camp, actually a desk camp because they didn't feed us, but 
Hungarians were in that camp. On, and they don't speak Yiddish and they don't speak German. And since I was a German, I was at fault. They didn't understand that I had the same clothing on that they had, striped, and that was a Jew. But they didn't, for some reason, they didn't understand. And I was, uh, I was not very well treated by them. And the sevens, yeah, the sevens of April, no, sevens, yeah, sevens of April, no, sevens of May, sevens of May, yeah, sevens of May, the guards left, I could see the lights went out around the camp, and I figured, well, they're going to blow us up which they didn't, but as soon as it got light, I crawled out to the next door. There was a, 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 a house next door, and I knocked on the door. I crawled. I couldn't stand up. Uh, and they, uh, there was a woman there, and I t asked her, could you give me something to eat, and could you clean me? Well, to clean me was very, very, it hurt because my, I only was bones and skin and, and I was so filthy, I wasn't white, I was brown. Can you imagine three and a half, four months without a shower, without water, without anything? We were crushed it. Well, I stayed from what I remember, one night, I think, maybe, and that was it. I don't remember anymore. I know she gave me a peeled, a, a baked potato to eat, which was the best thing I ever ate. And I wound up, I don't know how many days or whatever, later in the hospital. And the doctor stood beside me and he said, oh, you're alive in German. It was a Catholic hospital with nuns. And uh, well, I didn't realize what shape I was in. All I knew, I was hungry. And I asked them, give me something to eat. And they gave me two spoons full. And you can hear, you can imagine what language I used because I told them, you still want me to die. You don't give me anything to eat. Well, I didn't know that was good for me. Every couple hours, I suppose, I got a few spoons. And I was told after I recuperated that I weighed 70 pounds when I got there. And they didn't think that I would be alive. So I don't know, I have no idea how long I was unconscious. All I knew is when I woke up, the doctor was there, everything was white. You know, the nurses white, the doctor white, the sheets white. I figured, well, I'm in heaven. Well, I was very well treated by the nurses and by the doctors. There was actually nothing wrong with me. The only thing is I was hungry. And it took them, I think, maybe four weeks before I could sit down and eat a meal, a full meal, because, you know, I had to get I had to get some weight on me. And, uh, well, I stayed in that hospital three and a half months. And they got me to, I think it was about 150 pounds. 
I was in good shape. And in the meantime, I walked when I could walk, but after four or six weeks, I went to town. I figured, well, I have to look and see what's going on here. And uh, there was a big square and there was a Russian soldier standing far away and he waved to me, I should come. Well, when a Russian soldier says you should come, you come because he has a weapon, you know, he has a gun. So I did go there and he knew I had my, I had my jacket that was my ID. I didn't speak Russian. I had no ID, but I had a number on my arm and I had that striped jacket and he knew who I was. And he happened to be a Jewish officer, a Russian officer, and he spoke Yiddish. So he said, oh, well, we had a conversation in Yiddish. And uh, he said, uh, well, are you hungry? And I said, oh, not anymore, but uh, why? Oh, come on, I'll show you something. And he took me down quite a few steps to a, um, to a cellar full of food that was um, stored there by the Germans for the people when they needed, when there was no other supply. A lot of it under the, they had a cellar under the whole square very much, very big. And he said, he told me, Nimitz, Nimtzi, Nim, take everything you want. I said, I can hardly carry myself. I can't carry anything. And then I asked him, can I bring the nuns? He said, sure. So the nun, I told a couple of nuns, I said, we'll go, but you need a, a little wagon. You know, they had a they had some, they had a wagon and uh, I said, we go get something. And they, they went with me and we, he was there and uh, the nuns went down there to take whatever, whatever they wanted. So I fed the hospital, but under one condition. And there I had a problem. I told the mother superior, that if there's any SS in here, SS is a, the bunch that mistreated us, right? I don't want them in here and I don't want them to eat my food and I don't want to be with them under, my, under the same roof. You can't do that, she told me. Well, I said, you want to eat? <laughs> she said, yeah, okay then you do what I ask you. Send them out and the Russians will take care of them. Which they did, so that was it. And I had, after I, uh, yeah, after about three and a half months, I went to the Jewish Federation in that town and there were other, other survivors. And we, uh, we figured, but we don't want to stay here because the Russians, you never know what's going on. So we found a guy with a bus and we told him, look, there's put some uh, Polish Jews that had all kinds of diamonds and stuff. And they paid him to, we were about 20 or 30 people in the bus and we went to East Germany in the meantime, I made a, I had a girlfriend and I went with them. Her mother was there, which was no good, but I went to, with her to their hometown and I lived with them for maybe a few weeks, but the mother was a pill. So I, I didn't want to stay there. So I had an excuse. I said, 
I'm going to go to Berlin to find somebody, some of my relatives, somebody had to be alive. So I went to Berlin and I found my parents. They were in a displaced person camp. And uh, uh, in Bavaria. So uh, my name was nowhere. Well, there were people that were on the march. There was no, nobody knew where anybody was. It was, there was complete, I mean, no records kept anymore. We weren't counted. Some of them escaped, but the the Russian, the 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 Poles, and the Germans didn't like us. They they eliminated a lot of us when they were escaping. So where did you go? You go to the Germans or to the Poles? Either one is no good. So I figured. I don't speak Polish, and if I speak German, they know right away who I am because I'm at an age where I should be on the front, you know, fighting. So I stayed with it. Well, anyhow, uh, when I found out where my parents were, I couldn't believe it. I mean, my parents are old people, uh, old people. When now, I mean, they were, how old was my father? My father was 50 and my mother was 49. So they were actually not old people, but they survived and they were in a displaced person camp. And uh, when I got there, well, there was quite a, quite a reunion. Uh, when I, I had, it took me two weeks to get there because uh, roads and railroads, nothing was intact. Uh, a lot of walking and going with some, then sometimes a train went from one train to the other. It was quite hard. And uh, when, when I asked them to take me, uh, this place person came was in Degendorf and they said, Degendorf, you can't get there. I said, well, there are people there, so you have to be get, able to get there. No, you can't get there. I said, okay, take me close to it. So they told me how to go there and by train and then again train and uh, uh, horse and buggy. I mean, it, it took a while. and. When I got to the closest town, uh, little town that was a train station, there were uh, Polish Jews, a, a, a band that went to Degendorf. And they, I told them who I was. Oh, what's big deal? So I went to Degendorf and I met my parents. And uh, that camp was very, very nice. I met my, my wife, my girlfriend, and I always blamed my parents for that. And uh, that's how, uh, well, we stayed there for a year, over a year, more than a year. We knew each other for a year, I mean, there were lots of girls and very few boys. And uh, I, I had to do, I had to get a job. So they were looking for drivers. Well, the only thing I ever drove was a little tractor in, the, uh, in that town where I worked in the park department. That was my whole driving experience. And the tractor went about five or six miles an hour. So big deal. And uh, well, I told him, you sure I can drive? Well, 
They had American cars, Jeeps and trucks. And the first thing I drove was a Jeep. And uh, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't all that good. But uh, then I was a driver. We drove um, material for all the camps, all the displayed person camps in Bavaria. And there were quite a few. You know, there were a lot of survivors uh, from, well, most of them were not in the camps, but they were hidden or uh, in, in labor camps, but in, in uh, concentration camps, there were very few. But anyhow, that's where, what we, I did until, uh, until, what was it? Yeah, end of 46. Truman was the president then. And since we were the German Jews, uh, everybody, all Jews were stateless. There was no quota for stateless. So you couldn't come to the United States as a stateless person. And Truman passed some kind of legislation that that uh, allowed displaced persons of certain kind to come to the United States. Well, I came to the United States on the 2nd of March, I think it was. I came to the United States without my girlfriend. There was no room on the ship not enough room for women. So uh, she came about four weeks later and I, I, had, I got a job as a bus boy. I mean, any job, it didn't matter. I mean, I had no profession. I was not trained for anything. I didn't know anything. So they told me, bus boy, what is a bus boy? You know, my language was, uh, my English was pretty bad. What's a bus boy? Why well, you clean the tables and whatever? Okay, all right. I was told that in German because there was a German waiter in that restaurant, Jewish also. So he showed me what I should do and I did. And uh, the first two weeks, I don't know, I, I had no idea how I get paid, but I got paid very little, maybe 15 or $20. And I was supposed to get 10 or 15% of the tips that the waiters get. Now this was a fancy restaurant, French servers. You know, everything was silver and uh, I mean, very, very fancy and a lot of work. And then one of the bus boys approached me and well, I could understand some of it, what he said. And he, I showed him, he wanted to see my paycheck. My, we got it in a bag, you know, my, we got uh, cash in a bag and written down whatever it was for. And uh, he said, oh, that's not good. They're cheating you. Uh, I had no idea, big deal. I had no idea. I figured, well, that's what it is. And he said, look, they, they watched me for a couple of days. And they said, well, you got two waiters. I had to take a four waiters. You got two waiters that paid you good, the right way. And the other two cheat you. Now what you have, you have, you can't quit them. You have to take care of them. But what you do is you go very slow and always after you take care of the other two, just go slow, but you have to do what you have to do. I said, okay. So I guess the first two days 
they watched me and they said, no, you don't do that right. So they taught me how to do it slow. And uh, you would be surprised. After three weeks, I got a paycheck for $45. I'll never forget that. That was a fortune. I felt like a millionaire. And I went out to buy a suit, to buy a tie, to buy a shirt, to buy a hat. And when I picked up my wife from the, from the uh, ship, she came uh, four weeks later. It was already March or so, end of March. It was not cold anymore in New York. And when they seen me, they, they thought, oh my God, he got a millionaire. He got somebody. Look how he looks. They told me that later on, that they thought I was, I, I hit the jackpot. And all I did is I was, I looked like everybody else. So, uh, well, that was it. So we, we got married in May, had three children, and lived the American dream. What else can I tell you? My children are very good to me. My wife passed away 15 years ago with a disease that nobody else has, unfortunately, in Los Angeles. But I manage. Gerhard, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Does anybody have any questions at this time? You can go ahead and put them in the chat. I have a question. How did you find the strength to keep going? Well, I wanted to live. And it's, uh, it, it's amazing what you can do and how you get going. I have never thought that I would run into the fence and finish it. That, that was, I, I never, and I, even on the march, I, I went, oh, by the I had, when I got to the, to Auschwitz, to the Buna, I had um, riding boots. I had real boots on. See, the shoes and socks we could keep, but boots, they had no zippers on it. It takes two people, one that has them and the other one that takes them off. And it was such a pain with them. And then a couple, a guy, in fact, he was, he was a criminal, actually. He came and he said, I want your boot. And I told him, I didn't tell him I was happy to give it to them. No, I told him, bring us bread and bring us a good pair of shoes. Well, he tried it twice and three times. And then he brought a pair of shoes that were, that lasted to the last day. And for each of us, a loaf of bread. Well, loaf of bread, about as big as a piece of paper. But it was, it was worthwhile to get rid of those boots. And uh, the shoes were big enough to put, a, I mean, the socks don't last, you know, that, uh, how long? A week, two weeks? And they're full of holes, that's the end of it. But uh, I was told that if you can get paper from the cement sacks, you know the paper in the cement sacks? If you can get them, you put them in the shoe, make them fit, put them in the shoe, and they are the best insulation there is. And I had a piece of paper on my chest. In case, you know, they, the paper doesn't last that long. And I had that for, yeah, for the whole March. I had the shoes, they were, I mean, 
excellent. The, the, the strings were leather, leather strings, you know. And at night, when I took them off, I put the leather strings around my ears. So if somebody started to pull on the shoes, I woke up, actually. And my arms were always... <laughs> so I kept them to the end. And they were really, they saved my life too, really. They, to march in shoes instead of these wooden clots that they handed to the others. A wooden sole with claws on top. How long does it last in, in wet weather? I mean, snow is wet. And it was bad. So I, as I said, I was always lucky. And I stayed alive. Amazing, incredible, absolutely incredible. We have a few questions from the audience. Um, I also just posted in the chat uh, a link to a story, to Gerhard's story. He wrote it out because his family was absolutely adamant about him documenting it. And there's some also some photos on that website. So I just put that in the, in the chat. Did your parents come with you to the US? A question from Yvonne. No, my father as a blind man, uh, you had a guarantee for five years that uh, he wouldn't, would not uh, be dependent on the government. But I didn't have any money to take them, bring him over. I couldn't, I could hardly take care of myself. My father and mother were better off in Germany at the time. Number one, they did pay him a good pension. Number one, for, for being a veteran. Number two, for being in the camp. And my mother the same. So uh, they were better off in Germany because the dollar at that time the, the mark was four marks for a dollar. And there was no way that they could live and live in an apartment. And my father, you know, he had to, his surroundings had to be familiar to him. And my mother was very patient with him. And she really took care of him in the camp. She was very strong. In fact, they lived in a room with 30 or 40 people from what she told me. And she was the head of the, the room. She was the manager. So she could take good care of my father. Yeah, she was okay. And she, uh, she lived until she was 84 years old. She passed away in Los Angeles. She came after Oh, in 74, she came to the United States. My father passed away in 51. He had tuberculosis. He had heart troubles. They, they really did it to him in, in, in the camp. But he was not in the concentration camp. He was in a ghetto. Theresienstadt, I don't know whether you heard of it. That camp was a special camp for veterans, for mixed marriages, for uh, big shots and the rabbis and the, the leaders of congregations, etc. cetera. Uh, and others too. 140,000 people went through it and 9,000 survived. My parents with them. And my wife, was a uh, Michelin, meaning mixed marriage. Her grandfather was Catholic. Her mother was, her grandmother was Jewish. Her mother was half Jewish. You know, in 1935, that was uh, all really written down how 
the Jews are uh, identified and that doctors can't work and they, they were jobless. They couldn't work for non-Jews, etc. I told you that. But that, at that time, they also decided who is Jewish and who is not. Now, my mother-in-law's sisters were also half Jewish, but they married non-Jewish men. So they were left alone. They were not looked upon very nicely, but they didn't put them in camps and they were living like all the rest of them, non-Jews. My mother-in-law married a Jewish man, so they were Jewish. And that's why they wound up in Theresienstadt. Uh, her father, my wife's father, was sent to Auschwitz after a while. But they stayed in Theresienstadt until the end. And that's why they were in that camp in Dagendorf, which was uh, mainly the old people from Theresienstadt. And mostly were German Jews, and then uh, other uh, survivors came, Polish survivors, Russian survivors, whatever. Uh, they came then, and uh, the camp went, was, uh, it started with 500, I think, and we were about seven or 800 afterward. It was a nice, it was an officer's camp, officer's camp. We had a Olympic-sized swimming pool. Oh, we had, we lived like kings there. And when we went to the city, to the movies, no Germans allowed. When we were there, we were in the movies. Yeah. <laughs> well, in 45 and 46, we still could do that. And after a while, the Americans stopped us because we really kind of mistreated the Germans. Well, we took a ranch, right? We're entitled. <laughs> Gerhard, thank you so much. Uh, I have a comment from Suzanne. Your spirit is incredulous. Such a great story, and they love your story. Get him on again. Your mind is so clear. They want to know how old you are and if you have a book. Did you write yeah, a book? Yeah, I have a book. I have a book. The title is, can I show this somehow? We are the last. Yeah. And it can be found in medium.com. I, I put the link in the chat. So if you copy and paste that anybody into a web browser, anybody who's interested, you can read his story. Okay. Uh, through that. So, and Gerhard, how old are you? The final question, how old are you? <laughs> How old are you? 95. 95. Well, thank you so, so much, Gerhard. Did I tell you about this? That we were transported from Munich to Bremerhaven, come on the way to the United States in cattle car. And There's we, more. We, we, we were very, very upset, but if we would have said anything, we'd uh, maybe take a chance of not coming to the States. And the camp in the Bremerhaven, Bremerhaven Road Sea, uh, the ship was there and it was run by Polish, uh, but, but it was an English, uh, the, the English, uh, Polish battalion or whatever. And you know, the Poles like the, Ger the Jews like the Germans did. So it was, we were on curfew. We were behind fence. We were just like in a camp again, and which, which is, was very upsetting to us because they also stole our food. But we were afraid to say anything because, look, uh, you know, Americans don't, didn't like the Jews either, but that was beside the point. 
Remember the St. Louis, I suppose everybody knows about that. Well, we're gonna come to a close here. I would like to thank our partners and I'm gonna, we're gonna hear from them really quickly. Uh, Jackie Gamash uh, from We Are the Tree of Life. Yes, I, I sure appreciate you listening to my jabbering. And more pictures of, of Gerhard Story is on that website as well. Jackie, are you well, still- yet. I, 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 uh, I'm trying to work on it and see whether I can get them. Um, Brea from um, the Jewish Family Service. She has the pictures and she's trying to put them on, on the internet or something. Can you get in touch with her? Brea is her name. We can look into that. Um, the um, we are the, we're first we're going to focus real quick on we are the tree of life. Jackie Gamach, would you like to tell us what the we are the tree of life is about? Yes, and the, and the, due to the fact that uh, some of you have listened to uh, the presentation on CBS uh, by Francesco Lotoro, I saw yeah. at the San Diego Jewish Film Festival many years ago his movie Il Maestro. And uh, Francesco has uh, tried to retrace all the music created in camps, in ghettos during World War II. Yeah, Today, I Today, after 30 years, yes, go right on. I listened to that on 30 minutes, on 60 yes. minutes. Yes, and, I, and I, I, mean, I was in relationship with him, but uh, what he was doing and what he did for 30 years is to go back to all the composers who have composed during World War II. And that evolution gave me into the way it was music, it was poetry, it was dance, it was theater. And I was thinking about all those people who were living basically the conditions that you have expressed just today, Gera, have been able to stay artist. And finally, I came up with the concept with the help of my granddaughter and at this point of my family, that it was a way for them to survive, even if they were exterminated. Very it was a way so. for them. And when you think about the situation, how did they find a piece of paper? How did they find a pencil? Uh, it's almost impossible. That means I decided that we, we, we all can learn from that. Mm -hmm. And as we know very well the expression of Etz Chaim and the meaning of Etz Chaim yes. in, in Judaism, I say, let's all be part of the tree. We and are I decided to title this project. Yes? We have Go. marched out with music with an orchestra that, I mean, it was somehow, you know, when you march with music, no matter how bad a shape you're in, it kind of lifts you up. Yeah. And that's the reason I said they, they are survivors and we can learn from them by listening to their music, by, by listening to her poems, by listening to her dancing, by the choreography. You know, when I started do that almost a year ago after Pittsburgh, uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable the artistic life which were developing camps, like Auschwitz. Auschwitz had a piano. Auschwitz had theater presentation. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. we had. And that's what I am trying to say. Let's learn from that and let's survive that. And we, had, we had orchestras playing for the Nazis mm -hmm. and for the, for the uh, leaders of the camp. Those were criminals. They were non-Jews criminals. I mean, lifers, bad news. They, had, they could come to the, to the concert and you know, instruments were no problem. Everybody brought them and they had them all in, uh, you know, 
they, they had plenty of it. Yes. And we have to do many stories I, of violence. I'd like to say one thing. My, sure. my, the title of my book is We Are the Last, which has two, two meanings. Number one, we are the last. I am and a few others. But also, my friend, uh, Leo Diamant, was hung in front of us in, in October 44 because they were trying to escape, yes. And three, and the, there were four, and three of them were hung. The fourth one was a Pole who turned them in. And uh, Leo yelled to us, we are the last. Gerhard, thank you so much for sharing this. We're, we're going to continue your, me your memory, your legacy, and, and everything. Uh, the Jewish Federation is also one of our partners, and they're uh, uh, grateful for Gerhard for sharing his story and honoring the memories of all of our survivors. The Federation is proud to lead the San Diego Holocaust Survivor Coalition and appreciates the role the JCC is taking in Holocaust education. Did you know San Diego is home to 500 Holocaust survivors? from survivors of concentration camps to those that were under constant threat of deadly persecution. Currently, one third of survivors are living in poverty. Join us in supporting the 500 still in our community. Support survivor care, uh, volunteer or educate. You can contact Darren at the Jewish Federation if you wanna learn more at jewishinsandiego.org. You know, we have a new life club that's for survivors. Mm -hmm. We're thankful we have that available in, in San Diego. This week, uh, Jay Learn has a weekly Shabbat and Schmooze uh, every Friday. This week's program at four o'clock involves community conversation, uh, engaging in dialogue with one another. The topic this Friday is on traditional Jewish celebrations from baby namings to weddings. And Sarah will send in information about the Shabbat and Schmooze events in a follow-up email. And we'd really like to thank everyone for Zooming in today. And we hope you join us for the uh, the next, the final one in our series, in our three-part series, on Thursday, June 25th at 1.30 p.m., we'll hear Fanny Leibovitz present uh, for, the, for the last program in the series about our survival, resilience, and hope. Please sign up in advance if you'd like to receive the Zoom link and check our website and our emails. So thank you so much for sharing your story, Gerhard. And I was glad to do it. It's just incredible. I brought you brought tears to my eyes, and and we are just so thankful that you are sharing your story. There are survivors I, who remain silent because they can't face it. My proudest moments were last October. I was in Germany for three weeks, and I spoke to more than fifteen hundred Germans wow. in Stuttgart. Wow! And they were listening, and I had a standing ovation. Wow! And I told them what I, in German, I maybe overstated a little bit, but I felt, I felt they should really know what was going on. And uh, Yvonne wanted to be unmuted to make a comment. Let's see. Yvonne, do you know how to unmute yourself? Whoops. Oh, yeah, it's just... Okay, it's Amy. Hi, uh, hi, Gerd. I just wanted to thank you, really. That was wonderful listening to you. I did read your story that was posted on the uh, attached to today's uh, meeting, which was really fascinating. Um, and you may be very much aware of the second gen group that we've been watching. Uh, we have a movie club. You have to be a, a, a survivor, a child of a survivor or a grandchild or related to a survivor. So we are watching that and we, we, we're watching this Sunday. Um, well, we're not watching, we're discussing, we all watched it separately, Big Sonia, which is really an amazing story of this woman in Kansas. But are you at all familiar with the second gen group? Uh, second Gerhard? generation, well, they had it and then it fell apart. Yeah, and now I it's getting know. together again. No, I don't we, know become whether active. Uh, my daughter was not, I don't know. I'll ask her again whether she's interested. Yeah. My daughter she join them. A few months ago, she got married again. So. Uh, 
Well, it's, it's uh, what's most active is a movie club that we've started every other Sunday. We meet on Zoom. We meet, yeah. uh, we all watch the movies on our own and then we, talk, we meet to discuss. And the movies have been Big Sonia last week. Well, previously it was Alone in Berlin and last week was The Testament. Yvonne, how can somebody find out more about how to contact Second? Um, uh, I, I'll forward to you the uh, email. I, I don't you. remember it offhand, but I'll forward yeah, to I'll you. Tell my but you have to be a second, uh, you have to be a descendant in one way or well, another of a survivor. Yeah. Uh, my daughter and my son are. Yes. Right. They count. <laughs> right, of course they are. I don't know. Yeah. My son in Texas might be able to watch yeah. it. Yeah. Well, this is, this is here in San Diego, but. Um, of course, oh. on Zoom, anyone can watch. Okay. All right. Thank, well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.